Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, as we come to look at this warning that the Apostle Peter gives to us, your church, I pray, Lord, that we would have eyes to see, we would have insight into your word. Give us your spirit of understanding. Illuminate our minds now. Give me words to speak words that are accurate, representing your truth, your words, your heart, your mind to your people. Feed your sheep, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. The Christian life is a hard-fought fight. Paul tells us to fight the good fight of faith. Enemies are prowling around. We have the remaining flesh within us. We have the world outside us. We have Satan seeking to devour us. We are told in Revelation chapter 12 that Satan is prowling around seeking to make war with the children of the woman. And what do those under the power and influence of Satan do? Not only is it Satan making war, but those who are following this prince of the power of the air, they oppose the church of God also. We have the promise in Scripture, and we have it here in 2 Peter, there will be opposition. And Peter here is looking into the future of the church and preparing us for the attacks that will come. He's looking ahead and forewarning us of attacks. He's already reminded us of the truths upon which we stand, right? This glorious salvation upon which we stand. He's reminded us of the glorious hope of Christ's eternal kingdom. Why should we build? Why should we make our salvation sure? Because we have this hope of consummate glory with Christ. But now he proceeds to warn us. The rest of our time in 2 Peter will largely be that of warning. Here in 2 Peter 2, 2 Peter 3, both passages of warning. And isn't that what we find throughout our New Testaments? What did Jesus tell his disciples? Watch and pray. What did Paul tell the church in Ephesus? He says, the days are evil. Make the best use of opportunity. Make the best use of the time. Why? The days, <clears throat> excuse me, the days are evil. We are called as Christians to be aware, to watch and pray, to be alert. As John Piper so often says, to live with a wartime mentality. <clears throat> we are not called to kick back and relax. This is not vacation. We are in a battle for men's souls, for our souls. Satan is seeking to destroy you. It is said early in Genesis that sin is crouching at the door and its desire is to have you. Satan constantly attempting to trip you up, to steal your faith. Are we not daily in a battle of fighting for our faith as Satan brings in these insidious, treacherous lies, lying to us about our salvation, about our Savior, about our person in Christ Jesus. We're in a battle for our souls. Are we not, brothers and sisters? Is this not a warfare? And consistently we are told, fight. There's opposition coming. But this morning I want to talk about a particular evil. An evil in this world, more insidious and treacherous and dangerous perhaps than any other evil. It is that of the false prophet or the false teacher. False prophets, false teachers are those who distort, they manipulate and twist, and deny, flat out reject, the truth. Look there in verse 1. False prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresy. Heresy, simply, is a departation from the truth. It's a wandering away from the truth into your own idea and creating a new teaching aside from truth. It is error departing from truth. Even denying, he goes on to say, the master who bought them. Now we'll look at these two aspects in greater detail in coming weeks. But false teachers know this from the start. They distort and they deny. 
It's been so from the beginning. Turn to Genesis. I want us to do a quick survey of Scripture here. Turn back in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis comes right after the beginning of your Bible. It's the very first book of your Bible. And we see this deception of the false teacher right at the start. Look at Genesis chapter 3. We'll begin reading in verse 1. Here, Adam and Eve have been created in the garden. They've been given dominion over the creation. And now the serpent, verse 1, was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Here Satan approaches Eve in the form of a serpent. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Notice first, (coughs) Satan flat out denies the truth of what God said. Look there. Did God actually say? He's denying. God didn't say this. Did he actually? First denies the truth. But then look at the the manipulative way in which he twists God's word. You will not surely die, he says in verse 4. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, was that true? Partially. Did Adam and Eve, after eating, know good and evil? Absolutely. The world was flooded with depravity, with evil, and men since have been wicked and evil. They knew good and evil. But Satan was twisting the truth to paint a false picture of God and a false picture of sin. He's distorting, denying the words of God. We see it right there at the start. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah is one of the major prophets. Jeremiah chapter 3. And here we have a scathing denunciation from the lips of God to the false teachers in Israel. Notice what God says toward the end of this chapter. Jeremiah 23 verse 30. The words of God. Therefore, behold, 23, verse 30. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who steal my words from one another. Behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who use their tongues and declare, declares the Lord. Behold, I am against those who prophesy lying dreams, declares the Lord, and who tell them and lead my people astray by their lies and their recklessness when I did not send them or charge them so they do not profit this people at all, declares the Lord. They are liars, denying the truth. Here was Israel's greatest enemy. Who was greatest, the greatest enemy of Israel? Was it the violent Assyrians? Was it the Philistines? Was it the large, gigantic Canaanites? Was that the greatest enemy of the Israelites? Read through the Israel, Israel's history, their wanderings, their exiles, their captivities. Who's their greatest enemy? The prophets within their own walls. Those li- Think of it. God's people. When you have God on your side, who are you to fear? Oh yeah, the... the, the The giants in the land of Canaan, they're huge. We're trembling. God says, I'm with you. Go. Be bold. Be courageous. Go anywhere. I'm with you. I'm God. You look, when you have an enemy outside, Christian, you have nothing to fear. God is on your side. The greatest enemy of Israel, and we'll see the church, is the false teacher within its own walls. And God scathingly denounces it here. They prophesy lying dreams. But then look at verse 36. But the burden of the Lord you shall mention no more, for the burden is every man's own word. And notice what he says. 
and you pervert the words of the living God, the Lord of hosts, our God. There it is, the distortion of the truth. Not, out, not just flat out lies, but they also pervert, they twist, they transform the words of God with their deception. We have it through Israel's history. Or perhaps think of Jesus. Who was Jesus consistently, almost constantly coming up against? The, devil. the Pharisees. It was the religious Pharisees, the scribes. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 15. Now we get into Jesus' earthly ministry. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 15. And we read this starting in verse 1. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. Jesus answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. But you say, If anyone tells his father or his mother, What you would have gained from me is given to God. He need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. The religious Pharisees twisting the words of God, the law of God, for their own financial gain. How often manipulating the people at the Passover, setting up tables, selling, gaining financially from the people, twisting the words of God, even saying here, yes, we are supposed to support our families, but if we give the money to the church, you actually don't have to give the money to your mother and father. Ah, we can twist the scripture around for our own gain. And Jesus Christ says you teach as doctrines the commandments of men. Further, think of their denial, their flat-out denial of the Messiah Christ as he stood there in their sight fulfilling the messianic prophecies which they had memorized. And they denied him, knowing full well what they did. Again, the false teaching of the Pharisees and scribes, distorting and denying the truth. It was with Christ in his time. But this did not end even with Jesus. Upon Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, the false teaching did not go away. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul also was hounded by false teachers as he went place to place visiting the churches and preaching the gospel. Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, <clears throat> he says to the Galatian church, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Here the Apostle Paul going church to church preaching Christ crucified, preaching this glorious message. And who were on his heels? The Judaizers coming along saying, oh yes, you must have Christ, but you must add to it circumcision as well. Jesus plus something. An absolute distortion of the gospel. An absolute denial of the sufficiency of Christ's gospel. These false teachers hounded the Apostle Paul. Finally, turn to Revelation. Now we're at the last book in the Bible, Revelation chapter 2. Here Jesus Christ is giving a word to John for the churches, and he speaks <clears throat> to the church of Pergamum, and he tells them this in verse 13. I know where you dwell, 
where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Here we have the New Testament church commended by Christ for holding fast. And yet he has something against them. What is it? They put up with the false teaching in their midst. We'll look at Balaam in Second Peter. There little is known about the Nicolaitans, although men theorize from history, but we know that it's false teaching among the church. And so there we have it. From Genesis to Revelation, we have this promise that there will be opposition in the form of false teaching. It's been the pattern from the start of creation. A constant barrage of false teaching all throughout. Wherever you have truth, you will have error. Why? Because Satan is prowling around like a roaring lion seeking those whom he may devour. And so we come to our text in Second Peter. Peter's looking into the future. He's preparing us for this attack. And if I can just say as an aside, for your own understanding of Scripture, to take a passage like Second Peter, speaking about the false prophets, and to put it as a puzzle piece into the meta-narrative, the big picture of Scripture, biblical theology. Here we have the themes, different themes from beginning to end. Here this passage that we consider this morning placed into the meta-narrative of Scripture, the entire theme from beginning to end, it fits perfectly in as the pattern as it's always been and always will be. We see this theme. This is helping us to have what you could say is a unified Bible. This is not just information here and there, just, oh, here's a tidbit of wisdom, here's a tidbit of wisdom. Our Scriptures, our Bible from start to finish is unified. It's one of the glorious truths about Scripture as we look at it as God's Word, and it ought to be. If this is God's Word, it ought to be unified from start to finish. But this is a portrait of the biblical narrative. And Peter's preparing us for this. He says it's always been, it always will be. Now, as I approach this chapter, and the reason I read the entirety of the chapter, I want to do, I want to approach this and preach through this chapter logically, rather than chronologically. So as we've been kind of going verse by verse, I want to take this one concept by concept because we'll see, and the reason why I read the whole thing, Peter may start a thought about the false teacher in the beginning. He may touch on it slightly in the middle and then come back to it at the end. And he's doing that all throughout. These concepts are interwoven. So as I preach through this chapter, I want to do it just conceptually, not chronologically verse by verse. So we'll look at different verses as we go through. Together, it forms a complete thought, but it's not necessarily chronological. And so this morning, I want us to consider three simple points. We will look first at the homegrown origin of the false teacher. The homegrown origin of the false teachers. Secondly, we'll consider their insidious or treacherous or treacherously dangerous manner the insidious manner of the false teachers. And thirdly, finally, we'll consider the popular appeal of the false teacher. So first, the homegrown origin of the false teachers. If you're back with me in Second Peter chapter 2, look there at verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people. They will arise From among you, Peter says. This is the dangerous nature of it. They are not just going to be on the outside. Yes, they are on the outside. And we can see them even today. Can we not? You flick on TBN. You see the likes of the Osteen, the Hinn, the Jakes. You see these men and they're kind of out there. The untouchables in the TV world. And they seem to be outside the church. Certainly, false teachers will come from outside. 
but they will not just come from outside. Peter is here telling us that many will arise from within. Listen to a similar warning of the Apostle Paul. Don't turn there, but listen to the Apostle Paul. Speaking to the Ephesian church, he says this in Acts chapter 20. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Paul says, guys, when I leave, I know from among your own selves men will arise speaking twisted distortions of the truth. They are fierce, ravenous wolves. What are the Christians called? The sheep, right? Jesus Christ is the shepherd. He knows his sheep. His sheep know him. He calls them. He says, using that same analogy, fierce wolves, ravenous wolves will come in among you. Now, this will happen in one of two ways. If you think about it, they will either come in with an agenda, right? They will come in knowing themselves, I am a false teacher, I have an agenda, I am going to go in, become part of them, and propagate my agenda and lead some astray. We see that in 2 Corinthians 11. Paul warns of false apostles coming in. They, have, they claim to be apostles. They're false apostles. They're, they're deceitful workmen. They're disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. There's an intentionality. They're coming in with that express purpose. That's one way for them to arise among us, is it not? They come in with this agenda. But secondly, another way is that they will be among us as sincere seekers or thinking themselves sincere deceived themselves to their own error, thinking themselves to be genuine followers of Christ, and then they will wander away from the truth. You see, that's the reality that we see Paul warning Timothy of. In 1 Timothy 4, he says, some will depart from the faith. They will devote themselves to deceitful spirits, to teachings of demons. So there will be some among us who think themselves genuine, following Christ, following hard after Christ. I'm in line with this. And from that point, they will depart from the faith. Having thought themselves to be genuine believers, they departed away from it. And so what are we to do? What's an application there? Well, I suggest that this calls not for a paranoia and a skepticism of one another. Not looking with slanted eyes at one another, thinking, hmm, I wonder who, I wonder who it could be. I'm going to find them out. But rather, it calls for vigilance. Talking in the first hour from James about action, right? It calls for vigilance, for action. You say, vigilance toward what? Or vigilance toward whom? Well, vigilance toward two things. First, against sin in your own life. Christian, when you read this, that false teachers will arise from among us, first, it ought to cause you to be vigilantly aware and examining yourself for sin. Do you remember the Last Supper when Christ is speaking to his disciples and he says, the hand of the one who will betray me is at this table? What did they say? Did they go, who is it? What did they initially say? Is it I? Is it I, Lord? Immediate self-examination. Paul tells, some will depart from the faith. Examine yourself. Look here. Be vigilant. If you want not to depart from the faith, what does that require? A vigilance against sin in your own life. A violence against sin. Any sin that crops up in your life, you are violent against it. That's number one. A call to vigilance. But further, this is a call to vigilance to commend sin killing in others. A vigilance to guard your brother and sister from sin. Not a squinted eye approach, a slanted eye approach saying, hmm, I wonder if they're, they're the false teacher. I wonder if they're the one who's going to depart. 
but having a vigilance from love for them, exhorting one another daily that no one may be hardened by deceitfulness of sin, right? Exhorting one another that none here would be counted among those who departed from the faith, devoting themselves to deceitful spirits because we're vigilantly loving one another, caring for one another. You could say spiritually intentional relationships, right? Excellent exhortation brought to us several weeks ago. Are we intentional? Are we just kind of kicking it and enjoying one another? No, are we intentional with one another? First here, vigilant. I will not let sin crop up in me. I will be violent against it. But then towards others. So this fact that the, the origin of false teachers is primarily homegrown within us calls us to vigilance. Not a paranoia, not a skepticism where we don't trust each other and hold back but we're first vigilant towards sin in us. And we're vigilant in love, in commending sin killing in others. So that's the homegrown origin of the false teachers. Let's consider secondly the insidious or treacherous manner of false teachers. We will consider in chapter 3 the scoffers, right? Do the scoffers hold back? Do they try to hide their agenda the scoffer has no reason to hide. He's out in the streets proclaiming, this is foolishness, this is folly, this gospel, this Christianity. Ha, what, what silliness is this? Look at those weak people who need a crutch hanging on Christianity. They're not trying to hide it. They're bold, they're brash, they come out and just spew it. They wear their agenda on their sleeve. But one of the reasons that false teaching is so dangerous is because it's not so blatant. They attack in a more in a different way. This word insidious, the, this word insidious has the idea of secret. It slips in. It's insidious because you don't you don't quite it's treacherous. What you tell me this. You're walking along and there's a cliff, and there's sixteen signs that are bright orange. They say warning cliff. There's a fence there, warning cliff. You have to, is that a treacherous cliff? You see it, so you go the other way. What's treacherous when you're in the dark, you're walking, and you know, I don't know where my feet, and there's the cliff. That's treacherous. Why? Because it catches you unaware. The manner of the false teachers is insidious. It's treacherous. And it's treacherous in four ways. First, consider first, it's secretive. Look at verse 1. False teach prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Their method or manner is crafty and stealthy. They have crept in unnoticed, Jude says. Crept in unnoticed. Nobody even noticed where they came from. I want to give you an illustration. In March of 2007, Israel, the nation of Israel, suspected that Syria was building a nuclear reactor to build an atomic bomb. They had been suspicious of certain activity by Syria in North Korea. And so Israel deployed its special intelligence agency called the Mossad to investigate, to research this. They had caught wind through cameras that there was something fishy going on with Syria and North Korea and they didn't quite know what it was. (coughs) And so the Mossad did two things which were stealthy. They tracked a top Syrian official to his home in Austria. So they tracked this man, he traveled to Austria for uh, a meeting of sorts. And what they did, they, they traveled to Austria. They put a beautiful woman at this bar near this man's room, near his, near his home where he was staying. And on an evening, he went down to the bar and that woman went to that man and engaged him and seductively engaged him for hours. And as he's being wrapped in by this woman at the bar, he's, he's infatuated with this beautiful woman. Mossad agents are sneaking into his room, into the most inner, intimate inner chamber of his home, going to his computer, putting a chip in, taking all of the information out. They leave. As soon as they leave, they signal the woman at the bar. Got it. We're clear. She says, all right, see you later. Walks off. And the guy's left puzzled, wondering, what was that? Thinks nothing of it. Goes back. And now they've gained all of the intelligence, hundreds of documents, pictures of everything they need from this top Syrian official. They crept in unnoticed. How? They send a little distraction? 
keep him occupied. Didn't know a thing happened. He didn't come back. Didn't think anything of it. And now they've gained this information. That was the first thing they did. And so now they find these pictures of this nuclear reactor in a desert in Syria. And so they, they need to destroy it. They don't want this nuclear reactor being built. And so after months of, of strategizing, Syria had a high-tech anti-air force defense system. Anything that came over, no chance. You just blow it to smithereens, all these machine guns at the, on the border. So what they did, they came up with a device that the very split second where they were going to send their aircraft over the Syrian border, they flooded the radars of the Syrian, don't ask me how, technologically, Zeke probably knows, they flooded the radar with hundreds of dots. So it would look as if hundreds of planes are coming across the border, just for a split second. And so the defense system can't react. And then boom, boom, they're gone. They're over the border, they're in. Enough to drop 17 tons of explosives on this reactor and just decimate it. And on their way back, they do the same thing. They're out scot-free like nothing happened. And Syria's left there thinking, what just happened? Creeping in stealthily. Now here's the point. Don't take that illustration too far. But there's deception. They're creeping in unnoticed. There's stealth. There's scheming going on here. This, by any man's estimation, was a masterfully crafted plan. Was it not? And behind the false teachers... There is a masterfully crafty mind, the mind of Satan, thinking, scheming of ways that he can creep in unnoticed. How can I distract? How can I confuse? How can I shine the bright light? How can I get in among them to drop my explosives, to steal my information? How can I accomplish my mission? Well, the point is clear. False teachers work secretively, going under the radar, using distractions from the truth to hide and mask their intentions. And Peter's warning us. And so we think, well, what does this look? Translate this to today. Oftentimes, the false teacher is the liked, the personable, the one no one would suspect. The one, when he speaks, doesn't come out and blatantly proclaim error. Jesus Christ is not God. And we go, whoa, okay, you're wrong but making small, tiny, little twists. If you think of Paul's warning to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, you know what he says? These demonic, following these teachings of demons, you think, oh my, what is it? What, these teachings of demons, what is it? He says, oh, they just deny certain foods. You can't eat certain foods. Oh, and they, they can't get married here. This person can't get married here. Just little twists of the truth. He said, oh yeah, Christ is real, Christ is true, but you, in order to have Christ, you just can't have this food. You can't eat this food. Or like the Judaizers, oh, you've got to be circumcised as well. Little twists to the truth, little distortions, coming in as the least suspected person. They gain trust and a good reputation in order to achieve their damnable ends. That's the first insidious matter of the false teachers. It's secretive. They creep in unnoticed. But consider, secondly, sensually. Look at verse 2. Many will follow their sensuality. And then shoot your eyes down to verse 18. For, speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. The word sensuality, it means unbridled lust, excesses, licentiousness, lasciviousness, wantonness, outrageousness. It's just shameless, it's just indulgence. It's the same word, look there in verse 7, used to describe the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah. And if we know anything about Sodom and Gomorrah, it was just wanton, open, reveling in their sin. It's unbridled lust, giving in to their every craving, being driven by them. So how do we see this today? Well, to be specific, this is the core message of the health, wealth, and prosperity teaching. How many people want their cake and to eat it too? They want their sin, or I guess they, they, they want heaven. They don't want hell, certainly, so they want heaven. Uh, but they want their sin. They want to indulge in this life. 
They want to be okay with God and indulge in their sin. Health, wealth, and prosperity. They want their reward now. They want it now. Your best life now. Instead of storing up treasures in heaven. How can God serve me and my needs today? And you know what you see among these teachers? Sexual immorality. Indulgent lifestyles. Indulging in the treasures of this earth. The lust of the eyes. The pride of life. We'll consider that in greater detail in coming weeks when we look at the lifestyle of these false teachers from this chapter. But know this, it's absolutely opposite to God's word. Turn to Luke chapter 16. Let's, consi- let's sit and think about this health, wealth, and prosperity gospel for a second from Scripture. This indulgent lifestyle of living for the flesh, living for the now. Luke chapter 16, and we know it well, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Let's read it, starting in verse 19. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. Now listen to this. Listen to what the angel says. But, or I'm sorry, Abraham says, but Abraham said, child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things but now he is comforted here and you are in anguish a life lived for the kingdom of this world a life lived for now a life lived for the health wealth and prosperity of today You see, it has everything reversed. False teachers characterized by their sensuality, by their indulging of their lusts, have everything reversed. They promote the laying up and soaring up of treasures here and now, living sexually immoral, indulgent lives. They appeal to the very same in their hearers. It is by their sensuality that they entice the unsteady soul. So they are secret, they are sensual. Thirdly, consider they are deceptive. Look there at verse 3. 2 Peter 2, back in 2 Peter, I'm sorry. 2 Peter 2 and verse 3. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. If you shoot your eyes down to 19, they promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. With false words they will exploit you. They will say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. They promise you freedom, but it's a mirage in the desert. There is no truth substance. It is empty, fleeting joys that they crave and that they promise. They promise you fulfillment, but it's fleeting fulfillment. And you say, what does this look like today? I'll tell you, listen for those men who never warn of eternal destruction. Listen for those men who never warn of the lack of the holiness without which no man will see the Lord. Listen for those who entertain and who joke and who give smooth speech, comfortable, warm fuzzy, constant encouragement, just lifting up and building up, never warning of destruction, never warning that if you die in your sin apart from Christ, you are damned for eternity. You won't hear it said. Listen for what they don't say. 
in describing such false teachers, the ever-wise Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said it this way, He never makes you feel you are a sinner. He never makes you feel you are lost. He never makes you hate yourself and the sin that is in you. He is always telling you in one way or the other that you are wonderful if only you were given decent circumstances. Never exposing reality, the reality of sin, the reality of the holiness of God and how we stand in light of His holy justice and the perils of hell. You won't hear it said. You hear comfort. You hear blessing. You hear peace, peace. All is peace. When there is no peace, they come in a deceptive manner. But fourthly, under their manner, consider their arrogance. Second Peter 2.18 For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. Loud boasts is literally arrogant, haughty, pompous. It's used of arrogant speech. Folly simply emptiness or vanity. They are great swelling words of emptiness. What is Peter saying? They speak these great words, these fluent, smooth speech, words of comfort and peace, but it holds no truth. There's no substance. They are those enticing others with the fleeting passions which Moses so wisely avoided. Remember Moses, he cut right through it and saw, oh, sin has pleasure, but they're fleeting. These false teachers, defined by their arrogant boast, preach in eloquent words what has no substance, no truth, no hope. And they do so arrogantly with loud boasts of folly. And so we hear Peter's warning. He tells us to beware They will come from within our own selves. They will be secretive. They will be sensual. They will be deceptive. They will be arrogant. Spreading their false teachings. Now at this point, I would hope for each of us, I would hope you have some form of this statement ringing in your mind. Man, I want to stay away from that guy. If if I look at this description of this man... Let me stay away from him. Let me certainly not be him. Let me avoid such a false teacher. But consider this as we close. The popular appeal of the false teacher. Look there in verse 2. Many will follow their sensuality. The fact is, many will follow. Why? Why so popular? It's because of their sensual manner. Think about this. They preach exactly what their hearers want. Doesn't it make you think of Paul's warning to Timothy? In those, these days, they will accumulate for themselves, having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers who teach their suit teachers to suit their own passions. They will turn away from this. Don't give me this truth. Just teach me. Tell me what I want to hear. Suit my own passions. What I feel I want. You give that to me. And so the question to us this morning is will you steer clear? Will you? You hear their description. We're going to speak of their inevitable ruin. If you noticed, as we read, the destruction being held for them. And you say, oh man, I'm definitely, I'm definitely staying away from that guy. But will you really stay away from that guy? Think about it. The answer to that question lies in your desires. What do you desire? Those who fall prey, those who are in the category of many will follow, you know who they are? They are those unsteady souls. They want so many things, but they don't want Christ. 
They desire so many things, so many sensual pleasures, so much. They want freedom. Abso- I want freedom from hell, absolutely. And I want peace, and I want comfort, and I want satisfaction. But do you want Christ? Is Christ for you the be all and end all? Is he your all in all? Is, can you, like the psalmist, say, Whom have I in heaven but you? What on earth do I desire besides you? Is it your desire, truly, is it at the root of your desire to have the true knowledge of Christ, to walk with Christ, to talk with Christ, to be in communion with Him, hand in hand, discerning His will for your life. Is that your true desire? It is the unsteady soul, Peter tells us, that is enticed by such a teacher. Look there in verse 14. These teachers have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. Who do they entice, Peter? The unsteady soul. Unsteady vacillating. You're unstable. You're being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. You're not looking unto Jesus, keeping your eyes fixated upon the one by whom and through whom you must be saved. You're here, you're looking, you're wandering, you're seeking satisfaction. How will we be delivered from this attack, you ask? Oh, we'll go into it in greater depth. But you want to know how you're going to steer clear of this guy? Look at your desires. Do you desire Christ? Are you stabilized in Christ? Eyes fixated upon your Savior. My flesh may come. My flesh may fail. My riches may come. Comfort may come or go. Trials come and go. But I've got Christ. I'm looking unto Jesus. And I'm following hard after Him. I want to grow into His likeness. I want to be built up in holiness. Conformed to His image. I'm following Christ. I just want to know Him. Or are you after the benefits that you see in the Christians? Well, they have peace and I want, I, I, I want peace. They seem to be satisfied. I want satisfaction. They don't have conflicts among them, so I don't want conflict. And they seem to have financial prosperity. They're, they're not wanting and they're, they're taken care of, so I want that. So let me fall under this Christian teaching so I can get all my desires. That is the unsteady soul that gets led away by the false teacher because he comes in and you know what he says to you? Oh, I want those things too. And we can have it if we go here. And your desires lead you astray. It's the one looking unto Jesus. Brothers and sisters, the danger is from within. It's from within our own hearts. It's from within our own midst. Be vigilant against sin in your life. Be lovingly vigilant against the sin in others' lives. And look to Christ. Don't look to what you can gain. Don't look to these sensual passions. Find your all in all in Him. Find your stability in Christ. It's the unsteady soul that is prey to the deception, to the sensuality of these false teachers. Let us be alert. Let us be on guard. Let us be those eyes fixated upon Christ who stand firm against this inevitable attack. Brothers and sisters, it's coming. It started in creation, in Genesis. As Christ is walking through the churches in Revelation, he sees it there too. I have this against you. The false teachers are among you. It followed the heels of Paul. It followed Christ. It was in Jeremiah's day. All through Scripture, it's coming. Let us be those who stand firm against it, looking unto Jesus. Well, that begins our study on the false teachers. Next week, we will pick up again and look at further characteristics of them. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this light shining in a dark place that can be a guide unto our feet. Father, I pray for each of us that we would be vigilant against sin in our own lives and lovingly vigilant in sin in our brothers' and sisters' lives. Lord, we glorify you. We love you. Be with us now as we go. In Christ's name, amen.